Namaste and good evening to all of you. I'm going to continue tonight with my presentation of the ideas from the yoga in daily life. This is our third and most probably it's our last presentation in this series, our third satsang in this series. And um, for those of you who were here for the previous two times, I hope it has showed to you how rich yoga is, how much it can interfere. It can interfere almost with everything in our daily lives. Either you are having a physically demanding job or you are about to fall asleep and you want to do self-suggestion or you are part of a spiritual group or you are visiting an archaeological site or other, and other things, you can always uh, do yoga. And uh, this yoga in daily life, of course, is just one more argument to an integral yoga, to an authentic yoga, to a yoga which is um, touching all the parts of our lives, not just a gymnastic which gives us some lightness in the body and some fitness, but uh, something which is uh, touching all the dimensions of our lives. We have been studying a possible day, a typical day, with the starting in the morning and what do you do the first thing or other things and having a job and traveling and transportation and rest and recreation and watching movies and all sorts, how to do those things in a yogic way and which are the benefits that you can obtain, how can it increase the quality of your life. Last week we spoke about disease or going into negative emotions and we concluded with things like exams, like you can either use Ajna Chakra for studying for exams and I gave you examples that I applied exactly the same method and of course, any other thing that you can think about an exam, because they are not just exams like university style exams which are theoretical, but they can be a lot of exams. They can be a driver's license examination. They can be an examination for where you go to, for example, get a part in a movie, like an actor. You as an actor are auditing for getting a part, a role in a movie. You are going in a place where you need to have, let's say, more Manipura chakra, no? and you usually are a little bit problematic with your Manipura chakra, then of course you are working one, two hours before you go there on your Manipura chakra, then you will be spontaneous, fiery, quick, dynamic, and everything, and you will be qualified for that particular thing. You need in an artistic environment where you need to have some spontaneity on Vishuddha chakra, you need some, to have some creativity on Vishuddha Chakra. You work on Vishuddha Chakra one, two hours before you go to that place. And then when you are there, suddenly you are asked a question or something, and suddenly you go into a creative mood, and it's very easy for you to uh, emit creativity. Either you need Moranahata, or you need Zvadhisthana, or you need Manipura, or you need whatever you need, you can generate it. So it's not only about Ajna Chakra and studying and recharging your Ajna Chakra. Generally for exams, you have to be prepared with exactly what you need for that examination and you can help yourself massively with yoga. A bit of a scary point here and it is illustrated in the workshop which is happening these days in Agama is the phenomenon of death and preparing for death. Almost nobody prepares for death. All of you in this room, if I'm taking you to a theoretical examination, all of you can guarantee that in a hundred years you're going to be dead. There is not one utopian person, I hope, in this room who thinks that in a hundred or in a hundred and twenty years, let me be extremely generous, you are going to be dead. From Jesus to Buddha and from Rumi to Milarepa, everybody died. Even the people who apparently reached immortality, they physically died. Because that's the law of the physical world and that's how this world is conceived by the divine will. So it's part of the Dharma and of the divine will that you will die. You may be afraid about it, 
You may be not accepting it, you may be not understanding it, but death is guaranteed. And yet, nobody prepares for death. People prepare to pilot airplanes, but they don't prepare to die. And therefore, most people, exception made of yogis and a few extreme spiritual practitioners, nobody truly prepares to die. It's exactly like dying is nothing. But that is, if you analyze it carefully, that is a typically, typically materialistic attitude towards life. Because if any one of you claims that you are a spiritual person, then you know that death is not the end. And 80 years on the face of the earth cannot be compared with an eternity which follows afterwards. Therefore, whatever happens after death is way, 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 way more important than what's happening during these 80 years of your life. Simply because it occupies way, way, way more time in the history of the universe. Either death is the end of everything and there is no spirit, there is no soul, there is no afterlife, and then when you die, it's the same shit. Or there is something after death and it's going to go on forever. And therefore, what the fact that you die becomes super important. It's not unimportant how you die. It's exactly like you are supposed to take a rocket, a shuttle, and go to, the, to another planet. And you don't care about how the rocket works. What if you take the wrong rocket? What if it explodes in the middle of the trip? What if you point it at the wrong planet and you go somewhere else than you plan to do? Like this, this trip which you take from the moment when you die till all eternity is very, very important. Ridiculously, nobody prepares for death. Everybody finds it and says, oh, I didn't know it was going to come so soon. Can you give me another 50 days? No? Like bargaining with God for another 50 days because you're not prepared. Why not? You should have been prepared since you were 10 years old. Because that's the only certain thing in life. And thus, preparation for death in all forms of spirituality is a very, very important topic. And... Those of you who will attend an Art of Dying workshop once in your life, you are going to see where this goes, what it is made of. And this preparation for death can be preparation for your own death, and it can be preparation for other people's death, which is slightly different. There are different abilities required for administering your own process and for being able to take care of somebody else's process if that is possible and how that is possible. And then, of course, you are preparing for death. How? Ramana Maharishi, when his mother have died, has taken her into a quiet room where he forbade to be disturbed for the whole day. And as his mother was lying down to die, he put his right hand on her heart, on her chest, and he put his left hand on her crown chakra. And he started, of course, passing energy and using whatever spiritual methods he knew. And he spent like this hours and hours, two, three hours after his mother stopped breathing. Only then Ramana Maharishi stopped from this process. So Ramana Maharishi prepared and he knew what to do when a human being was dying, he knew what to do for his mom and he knew what to do for himself. You can see images even of Ramana Maharishi 24 hours before his own death as Ramana Maharishi was sitting up, supported by some cushions, it's true. He was very, very sick with cancer and Ramana Maharishi was going into states of ecstasy, was going into states of samadhi and was preparing. So did Swami Shivananda, so did many other great yogis. So there is a preparation for death, talking about yours, talking about other people's deaths. You can be confronted with the circumstance of attending a burial, a funeral service. 
if you are an ignorant and you don't know, like, why would I want to go to a funeral? They invite me to the funeral of Walter. Like, everybody will be dressed in black. Everybody will have depressive moods. Everybody, because we won't find anybody dancing with joy that Walter has passed away, right? And we're going to see long faces, and everybody will pretend to be very concerned. And some people will look at the wristwatch and they say, oh, shit, I'm late, you know, like they wish they were not there. And there is a lot of social formality, and there is a lot of falsity, and you have to be there because it's your uncle or your aunt or somebody, and it's like, okay... How long time? You know, let, let the priest do it short and so on. You know, and can you actually do something for the person who is lying in the coffin? If you are not a yogi, you definitely cannot. And thus, the whole thing is becoming useless and artificial. And applying yoga in daily life are there things which you can do when somebody is dead. Dead people as you learn in the art of dying in great detail, they, are, they can copy your energy if you address them properly. So if you go in Sahasrara, they can go with you. It's exactly like I have a rocket up my spine, and then there is somebody here who is just a jellyfish. And if I hook the jellyfish on my rocket, when my rocket goes up the spine, I can take them as well. Therefore, it is possible to help people in the dying process even people who didn't receive any help or indication during their dying process or immediately after death, you go to a funeral, a funeral happens four days after a person has died, you can do things for the dead people even five years after they have died. You can still influence them in a beneficial way. That's what we teach you in the art of dying. Therefore, you are just going to a funeral you want to help with something. If you don't help with something, it's just a sad social event and you want to be out of there as soon as possible because you are wasting your time. And like I can quote again from my experience, not because my experience is essential, but because it's most easy to uh, speak about things that you have seen. I can simply tell you a little story and that's what I did at the death of my best friend in the young days. I had a best friend, and when we were both around the age of 26 or so, the father of my best friend passed away. He suffered from a heart condition, so he passed away quite young. This was a very kind man. I had eaten food cooked by him. You know, like I was close to him. I knew him, and I knew he was a good person. I have visited his son, the environment in Romania, it's not in those days, it was not like in the West. Like when you had a dead person in the family, you kept the body in the house. You didn't take it to a funeral home. The corpse in a coffin was staying in the house so that the relatives can come and pay homage. So the house is an open house for three days and the relatives and the friends can come and visit. And uh, so I've been there, visited, and then at the funeral I went there and at the funeral, of course, I started doing what I knew, like this man called Peter, he was there, and I addressed him in my mind, and I said, Peter, if you want some help, I'm here for you. Of course, there was the religious service being done, and a lot of other things were there. I just wanted to do my part as a yogi. So I went there, I addressed, I connected telepathically with this person, and then I started doing the rising of energy, powerful rising of energy. As soon as I did five minutes of rising the energy, like I noticed that there was a lot of grace and that the rising of energy was working like three times stronger than in normal conditions. Like the results were disproportionately strong, which means that something was happening and the energy was truly flowing that way. I didn't care. I continued and continued. The priest did some part of a ritual or something right there near his grave and it, I continued like this for about 25, 30 minutes. When I opened my eyes, I, like I have done my thing and I, fin I felt that now is enough, I have seen a beautiful scene. I have seen a sort of a meteorological miracle. It was a November day in Europe. The sky was like dark gray, heavy clouds. It had been raining or snowing, actually, around in that part. And when we started... 
and in the moment after 25 minutes when I opened my eyes, they were, they were simply like somebody had come with a cutter and cut the clouds on approximately three kilometers diameter. Like there was a huge hole in the skies, like drawn with a compass. Like it was completely blue skies just on a hole like this. And all the rest was to the horizon, all the rest was dark gray and still snowing. In this place, the snow had stopped and the skies were blue and the sun was shining. And then of course, this was for me a signal that the effort which I have done, maybe there were other factors. His son was also a great yogi and was doing his own effort. So somehow, but I felt a lot in my own body, so I knew that something had happened. I had no idea it would have an effect. And of course, most people who were in that funeral, they didn't look up. They didn't kind of notice exactly what was happening because they were preoccupied with these things. And then there is this hypnosis, this hypnotic energy, which makes that things are happening and people don't see them and they miss the whole point. So in this way, something doesn't radically change in their consciousness. They stay in the state of ignorance where they were before. They are not touched by paranormal events too much because they don't notice them. And therefore, this was a thing which I did like I wouldn't go to a funeral without rising the energy, working on Brahmarandra, subliming, developing Udana Vayu, praying, invoking God for grace, and other similar things. That's what I do when I go to a funeral. So th therefore, you can go to a funeral like an ignorant person. You can go to a funeral like a yogi and actually do something. And uh, I'm telling you that it's not only that I did something for old man Peter, but I did something for myself. I learned a great lesson. It gave me a great confidence in the moment when I saw that you do it. That was perhaps my first time when I participated to a funeral from a yogic standpoint. Then it was easier for me to do other things when this breakthrough came there. So it, it was not only for Peter. It was something which I did for myself because I didn't want to attend a funeral like blind. Again, preparing for death is a bit more difficult. Those of you who are studying currently the art of dying or who will start to study it in the future, you will see that there is a very strong karma associated with this because dying the right way makes a huge difference and will have gigantically different consequences. And precisely because of this, most people don't understand that it's necessary to do that and therefore they do it in the wrong way or they don't do anything about it, thinking like, ah, what does it matter? Once you are dead, you are dead. That's only a purely materialistic view on the world and on the process of death because we don't see what's happening after death and therefore it's more easy to believe that nothing is happening after death, which is profoundly not true. Stimulating states of creativity, it is a common image of the fact, as I said, I alluded to it already, that the artist is typing a writer and he, then he takes the paper and does like this and throws it to the dustbin. And for the last 10 years, he was unable to write a single page to his book or he cannot paint anymore or he cannot compose music anymore. And that's because he is short of creativity. But in yoga, we know that, for example, creativity, one of the conditions of creativity is the synchronizing of the brain hemispheres. It has been demonstrated by modern brain science that people, when the creativity flows, the brain hemispheres are balanced. This is very seldom happening because people are either left brain hemisphere or right brain hemisphere typologies, and usually one of the hemispheres predominates. What is a method to balance brain hemispheres? demonstrated by Maharishi Mahesh Yogi in the 1970s and 80s. Mantra meditation, 20 minutes of mantra meditation produces a huge state of balancing of your hemispheres and it gets strongest at approximately four, five hours after the meditation. Like there is a wave effect in your brain. You do now 20 minutes of mantra meditation, four hours later you are full on. Moreover, 
in yoga what creates true art creativity. Literary creativity sometimes is in anahata, and creativity for music, for aesthetics, and other aspects of art is in Vishuddha. I want to have some creativity tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock because I go to my workshop and there I need to paint or compose music or write a book. At 5 o'clock in the morning I wake up, I do 30 minutes of mantra meditation, then I do a little bit of yoga and I activate my Vishuddha chakra and a bit of my Anahata chakra. So when I'm going there, my creativity will flow like that. Creativity is not an unknown measure that, oh my God, I'm getting no creativity anymore. There are many artists who get creativity, they get some success, because they get some success, their ego is becoming really big because they make money and they are admired. They start smoking, drinking, taking drugs, partying, ejaculating all day long and stuff like this. And in five years they complain, my creativity is not there. I don't get creativity anymore. You don't get creativity because you treat yourself like shit and because you are decreasing the right energy. You want to have creativity all the time. You work on Vishuddha, on Ajna. You balance your hemispheres. You make sure that you have enough vitality in your root chakra. You make sure that your channels of energy or nadis are clean enough. And then you are going to be creative till the age of 100, if that is the case, if that is the story of your life. And therefore, you can help any one of you here has a creative job and you are living with this funny idea that creativity comes and goes, that's a wrong idea. Creativity can be always there if you cultivate it. But you have to understand what is creativity and how to cultivate it. Another circumstance where you want to use yoga is when going in various astrological circumstances, such as in Agama we give you examples about the two opposite effects of the moon, the new moon, the Shivaratri meditations, and the full moon when we usually do yang spirals. So new moon, full moon, and other astrological circumstances, they have their specific energy. Very soon, in about two, one month from now, we are going to witness all the spring equinox. The spring equinox is a very big astrological hiatus, and the energy for half an hour around the mathematical time of the spring equinox is very, very peculiar. Of course, if you don't pay attention, it's exactly like there is a northern light, like Aurora Borealis is shining, and you are looking down and doing some agriculture. You'll never see the northern lights unless you look up. So you'll never understand what energy is happening at the time of the spring equinox unless you meditate on it, unless you look into it. Otherwise, it's happening without your participation. And thus, uh, on many astrological moments and other special moments of energy of nature, a lot of things are happening. Even let's take a small one. Today, we are on the 18th, and in the end of tomorrow, the beginning of the day after tomorrow, we are moving into a new astrological sign. We move from Aquarius to Pisces. The energy changes. Somewhere tomorrow night, or a bit later, Saturday somewhere, the energy, I didn't calculate the exact hour of the transit, but when that happens, the energy will change. There are many yogis who feel it very clearly. They feel that now the days have a different energy than they had in the previous days. So you can use these things. No? Lao, in two days, the Pisces starts. What is the Pisces characterized by? It's a water energy. So what does it mean? Two days from now, Svadhisthana Chakra will become stronger in all of you. There will be more energy in Svadhisthana. Those of you who are depressed and who are Svadhisthana Chakra jellyfishes are going to go like, oh no, you know, like more Svadhisthana is exactly what I don't need. And some of you who may need actually a bit more Svadhisthana because you are too, too dry in your structure will go like, yeah, you know, that's when I should do some Sukhasana or some Shalabhasana or whatever asanas you are doing because it means three days from now, Svadhisthana Chakra will work really, really nice. And thus, I'm saying in yoga in daily life, we use circumstances and times of the day, what's happening just before sunrise. In India, many traditional yogis, they say you should meditate the 48 minutes before sunrise, the Brahma Muhurta. 
What is Brahma Muhurta? Why 48 minutes? Why not 30? What is, what's 48 minutes? Where does it come from? And why before sunrise? And which is the energy which is specific there? And what energy is specific for midday when the sun is up in the zenith? What is specific to the sunset? What is specific to midnight if you do something at midnight? And therefore, for moments of the day, for times of the year, or for any other things, they are special energies, and the yogis understand these energies, and they use them in the daily life. For example, as you know from the bad Hollywood movies, all the demons appear after sunset. Why don't the demons like the sun? While the sun is up, the demons are sleeping. They are hiding. So why? What's the story? Why do they like the moon and they don't like the sun? No? What's, what conclusions do we derive from this? And uh, the list could continue. No? Like the metal of the moon is the silver and the metal of the sun is the gold. So if I wear silver a lot, it's like I'm living in the daytime, but my energy is in the nighttime. So I can have demonic influences on me in the daytime because I wear a lot of silver, too much. Because silver is like the moon and like the night. I want to avoid to be disturbed by demonic entities. I wear more gold. Gold is going to defend me even in the night. Therefore, from this, if I would go down this alley, there will be so many conclusions, but for that you have to come to an astrological workshop and learn properly the astrological connections, and then you will be able to make connections for yourselves and understand what the consequences are. I had one friend, one yogic friend, who was very much, who was very keen on the attitude of the body. He simply said in daily life, one of the things which you don't do and which you could do is apply the principle from the asanas. Asanas say that the attitude, when you take a certain attitude of the body, that creates an aptitude. And Gurdjieff has this beautiful quote, which we quote for you during the second day of yoga here in Agama. So if you catch yourself, if you catch up, your, if you survey yourself, you're going to find yourself that in many times of the day, you have a not good attitude. If you would watch yourself from outside, and say, what is the body language of this person saying now? You're going to say that your body language is not good. So you are actually doing bad asanas. You are doing bad mudras you know, with your body. And then you are wondering, why am I depressed all the time? Question, why do you keep your body in a depressive position all the time? What would it cost you to supervise yourself every five minutes and to stop assuming depressive positions with your body? Such as, first thing, keep an erect spine. You see people all the time, they have a noodle instead of a spine. Yeah? And then, you know, intuitively you can say, what's the difference between the energy of an erect spine and of a noodle spine? No? It's obvious that there is a big difference. And like, shouldn't I cultivate it? Shouldn't I use awareness? Here is an exercise of attention and awareness that we can have all the time. What about your voice? What is the difference between having and having a firm voice? Speaking abdominally, speaking from Manipura, or speaking from Anahata, or speaking but having a firm voice. And when you come and talk to people and so on, you use a voice which is appropriate to it, and you can practice your voice. We do that in our teacher training programs, because teacher yoga teachers have to be able to project their voice. Because if you don't project your voice, other people don't even listen to you. No? And we do exercises with our yoga teachers where we ask them to sing, to tone, to do, to project their voice to the bottom of the yoga hall, to the other end of the yoga hall, so that they can be. This changes a lot. It produces because many people say, yeah, but I always had a weak voice. You had a weak voice because you are a little chicken. You are a little rabbit. And you are not being seen. This is related with your psychology. Napoleon was a small guy, but he didn't have a small voice. When you have to become like Napoleon, you need to have a great voice. Your voice is related with your psychology, with your body, with everything. 
you think little about yourself, that's you are going to have a little voice. People that have a little voice usually don't think big about themselves. They diminish themselves. They have a low self-esteem and other such con connections are to it. So precise gestures. You are doing some gestures. People often do gestures either chaotically and they disturb and break things or their gestures are vague and fluffy and so on. But look at public speakers. They have sometimes very precise gestures. Look at the gestures of Mussolini and Hitler in their films. And you see, these were people who were gesticulating vehemently and powerfully, and they created a charisma in millions of people. Unfortunately, that charisma may have been a diabolic charisma, a dark charisma, a negative one, but it is a charisma nevertheless. And you can be sure that if Jesus was talking to people, he was not just sitting like a choir boy. Blessed are the poor in spirit, because or you can be sure that Jesus did something when he said that, because he felt it, he lived it out, he experienced it. There was something in him, which there was something which was transmitted. Jesus was moved by his own words, because he believed in them and he felt them to be true, and that's why one can choose to have precise gestures to increase one's one can choose to have breath awareness like Swami Shivananda there is a second Swami Shivananda from Bengal not the great Swami Shivananda from Rishikesh Swami Shivananda from Bengal says never walk without coordinating your breath like if you go from here to 7-eleven you can as well go one, two, three, four, inhale, one, two, three, four, exhale, one, two, three, four, inhale, one, two, three, four, exhale. In this way, the trip to 7-Eleven becomes a bit of yoga. It becomes a breathing exercise. No? But as I said, as you can see, all the yoga can be, t oh, I'm sorry, all the life can be turned into yoga. Let's be honest, the biggest obstacle here is the good old little demon. Because when you give to people to do yoga, or Christian prayer, or Buddhist meditation, or whatever, all the time, most people go crazy. That's why in monasteries and others, they take it very easy, they study a little bit, because they know that a lot of things would appear. I'm telling you a very simple thing from Agama. When we do the teacher training program, we make people do eight hours of yoga or something like listening to lectures and yoga per day. And after a month or two, many start going crazy. Why? Because of the demon. Because the demon does not accept that you should do eight hours of spiritual practice per day. It's too much. It exorcises you. It takes the demon out and the demon is fighting back. It won't go away without a fight. And therefore, this is the problem. The whole yoga can be done into a the whole life can be done into a yoga and most people don't because in the moment when they say I'm going to 7-eleven I'll breathe there comes a voice in your head which says at the fuck with it this agama is driving you crazy you are doing yoga all day long now you want to breathe while you go to 7-eleven give me a break why give me a break to what give me a break so that I listen to some lady gaga that for that you want to give me a break it's obviously not an angel which tells you that that voice in your head who says give me a break is not the voice of an angel because your guardian angel would wish that you pray 24 7 your guardian angel would wish that you do pranayama and yoga 24 7 God wishes you to do yoga and spirituality non-stop so that you can reach the kingdom of heaven quickly quickly so when you don't and you say, but Swami, we are just human. Yeah, you are just human, which means slightly possessed by demons who don't allow you to do yoga 24-7. If you would be like Jesus, you would be into yoga 24-7. That's the sad reality. So, therefore, remember it's normal in the human being that there exist opposing forces. And those opposing forces, you have to learn to deal with them. There is a strategy slowly slowly life is there is a lifelong battle 
mystics from Buddhism, Hinduism, Christianity, Sufism, Jewish mystics, and others. They have all witnessed to it. If you will bother to read the great spiritual texts which show the direct experience of such people, you are going to see that they witness this negativity all the time. There is no yin without yang. There is no light without darkness. There is no, you always have the opposites present. And therefore the question is, how do you deal with these opposites without breaking down? This story, this rabbit hole is very deep because normally there are people who go into a monastery, they try to pray to Jesus, and after six months they get tired. And then they get tired and they say, I can't do all this. You know, it's like it's too much and so on. And then they declare themselves defeated. Maybe they don't dare to come out of the monastery, but they start faking it. They start not practicing brahmacharya anymore. They used to go master because they don't believe like in the first day when they came in the monastery. They start making compromises and they start making compromises because they lost their hope in salvation and they lost their hope in salvation because they saw that they don't have enough perseverance to do and do and do and do and do and then people think in black and white if I can't do yoga 24 7 it means I don't love God enough and it means I'm a bastard and I'm demonized and I'm never going to make it people jump from total white into total black this is why I'm talking about this to you because it's very easy to give up, especially if you are a perfectionistic, a sort of a fanatic, integristic type of personality, then you are going to say everything or nothing. Right? That's not true, because everybody is fighting with whatever life gave to them, with whatever the instruments you got from God, that's how you are fighting. And if some of you have enough spirituality to do spirituality two, three hours per day, so be it. Two, three hours per day is infinitely more than those who do zero hours per day. And therefore, things in spirituality are not black and white. That's why spirituality is not easy. Because you have to look at yourself, and looking at yourself, you see a lot of miseries. And you see a lot of imperfections. And then if you start hating yourself and becoming self-destructive, you flop. It's a miserable flop. You have to be able to love yourself even as you are not perfect. Love loves even those that are not perfect. Love is universal and unconditional. And that's why this is a very important thing because I'm saying more and more things and eventually you are going to say that if you want you can be a yogi like 24-7. But then people say, I need a break. A break for what? A break from being one with God, a break from being at a high level. It happened at crazy levels. There was the great master called Ramakrishna. He had so much accomplishment. He was so powerful in his yoga and he got so mystically crazy, we can say, that one day he did, like mystical yogis from India say, that's why he got a cancer in the throat a couple of years later. Because one day he simply jumped over the top. He overdid it. One day he were, they were doing some kirtan and bhajan and he got into his mystical states of samadhi and he could see that the others were not yet in samadhi, that they were disciples practicing. And he got so full of love and compassion looking at those poor people trying to reach God but not yet reaching that state of consciousness. And then he started crying. He went into some hysterical outburst and he said, oh, how much I wish that you could all see this divine reality which I'm seeing now. And then he started coming and touching them with his hand one by one. And everyone that got touched went into samadhi. He put them in samadhi just by touching them on the forehead like this. And they started going in samadhi. He put about 20 people in samadhi like this. And one of the people who was put in samadhi was a man who was, who had not, who was not a spiritual disciple entirely. And Ramakrishna was so insane that he couldn't even see that he was giving it to the wrong people. He just gave it to everybody. He was like a tsunami, you know. He just brushed everybody in the hall with it, you know. And this guy came after two days or three days and he said, Guruji, take it away from me. Stop this state because he said, wherever I look, I see God. I am aware of the fact that this is the universe and the nature, but it doesn't matter because wherever I look, I see God. 
and he said, I have two kids, and I work in the railway company, and I need to put bread on, and butter on the, on the table of my kids. And if I continue like this, they will fire me for surely, because I've been going for two days at my job, and I cannot do any job. I'm sitting in my job and seeing, I'm sitting in my office and look at the shelves, and the shelves are God. And I'm just smiling and going into bliss by looking at God. And my work gets not done. And they will fire me. So he said, for the sake of my kids, stop my states of samadhi. I, incredible. And Ramakrishna, of course, if he was the guru and he was asked to, he did it. He said, okay. He prayed to Kali and he said, Kali, take this state from this man because he's not prepared for it. And the guy said, it vanished after this. And then 20 years later, when Ramakrishna was dead already, since long, somebody interviewed him. He says, I, I heard that Ramakrishna. And then he said, yeah, he described the story. And then he said, now I realize what a jerk I have been. What a stupid imbecile. He said, because he said, my life continued and my family didn't give me any happiness eventually. It was just a trite life. I sacrificed everything for my kids and my family. And eventually it all got boring and disappointing. Like most of the things in this world. And he said, and that state which I had with Ramakrishna... It was bigger than anything I've ever experienced. Life and death could not compare to that state of consciousness. It was something, no, and now I realize I have been weak, and this has been like a spiritual test for me, and I collapsed at this test. Because if I would have not asked Ramakrishna to stop it, this state of samadhi would have continued coming and coming and coming and coming, and eventually I would have, re I would have become a great master in yoga. It's true, I wouldn't have been a clerk in the railway company. What does it matter? No? So that's why we say um, not everybody is prepared to be a yogi 24-7, and there are various limitations in our being. And those limitations, you can ask yourself, you know, I would like to be with God 24-7. And then there is something in me which says, nah, too much. Is that an angel? Is that a divine force? Can't be. Obviously, we know that all our limitations are of the different nature. They belong to the different realm. And uh, again, we don't have to hate ourselves or despise ourselves for it. There is a growth. The human being has to grow. And in the beginning, we are gorillas and chimpanzees. And slowly, slowly, we become superhuman. It's a process which takes years and years of evolution. That's why some people would like to do yoga quickly, quickly. It's not possible. When they ask Jesus, when does the kingdom of heaven come? And he says, a new kingdom needs new subjects, new people. And therefore, when the people change, that's when the kingdom of heaven comes. It cannot come arbitrarily like this. Therefore, with these things that you could have breath awareness or precise gestures or erect spine or something, all day long is yoga and awareness. If the little demon inside your head doesn't say, oh, okay, give me a break. Like, you could be aware of your food. Now, I, I don't want to be aware of my food. Leave me alone. Who's that, an angel? It's not an angel which says, now I'm fed up with being aware of my food. It's obviously the forgetfulness. The dancing Shiva, I said it the other time as well. The dancing Shiva have its foot, look at the Shiva hole and see, has its foot on a little creep, on a little creature. That creature is considered to be a demon and it's called Apasmara Purusha. Mara, like in case of Buddha, it's the same, it's common traditions there. Apas is the water, Zvadistana, Mara of Zvadistana, the water is Zvadistana, the water is Mara, Apasmara Purusha, and Apasmara Purusha is translated as the demon of forgetfulness. Because that's the human condition. The human condition is a condition of forgetfulness. And some great masters, they say, remember, 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 remember. And the truth is that man's worst enemy is the man himself. Like, people don't want to go there. I remember when I discovered yoga, I had a friend from my childhood, and I wanted to convey with him yoga. And after I did one year of yoga, I was in the university, and then I came back to the city of my parents, and I met with this old friend, and I told him, wow, let me teach you yoga. And he did it a little bit, and he immediately started having results. But he was not with me in the same city. We did university in two different cities, and he was alone, and he didn't have this. And then after a month, he stopped, and he told me, I thought 
I, I noticed that I was changing and I did not want to change. I just wanted to remain the same. I was afraid to change and become different. That is, for some people, there is resistance to spirituality. You want to, and then something in you says, no. No, like, today, after 25 years, if I would meet him, I could ask him, what was so valuable to stick to? Like, why didn't you change? Were you Albert Einstein? Were you Mother Teresa? What was so precious about you that it, didn't work, it wasn't worth it to change it? Nothing. The man is just a music teacher in an anonymous city in Romania that you have never even heard about, you know. He's not, he hasn't done anything exceptional in any way. He wanted to be this Mr. Nobody. That's what he wanted to be. Well, he is Mr. Nobody. So, Buddha did not want to be Mr. Nobody. I'm telling you this to understand that the psychology of the spiritual development is a different one. Exercises, to continue with the list of things, I have about three, four paragraphs left here. The exercises of the five senses. Like you have five senses. Could you play with them? For example, one of my good friends, which I quoted, I mentioned before, he, loved, he liked, liked very much to have a lively gaze. He says you look at the eyes of some people, and many of them look like sleeping bovines. Can you look in the eyes of somebody and see them looking at you sharp and kind of lively? And it's like, I'm on the same page with you. I'm there. I'm there. I'm here. I'm fully awake. I'm alive. I feel what you're saying. You know, like lively gaze. Look alive, people. You know, isn't that an exercise? Can you actually transform your dull gaze into a lively gaze? No, practice it. Look at each other. Look at me. Can you look at me in a lively way? Or are you half asleep because I'm boring here? And so on. It's like, are you receiving some spiritual information? Like, be alive. Look at me alive. No? Practice liveliness. Straighten up your spine. Stop being half asleep or tired. And look alive. No? Like, practice a lively gaze. No? Sparkling eyes. Make your eyes sparkle a little bit. No? Can you do that? That you're not doing it for me. Oh, Swami is going to really feel good now because he's going to see. It's not about me. Yes, I do feel good, but you're not doing it for me. It's something which comes out of you. It's your thing. Careful audition. Gottfried von Durkenheim, the, a German author, wrote an excellent book in the 1970s or late 60s, which is called Hara the vital center of man. He was influenced by his studies of Zen Buddhism and of Japanese Buddhism. And he starts with a, in a beautiful way with an introduction. He says, and in the 1960s, 70s, this was still there. It still is there, but much less today, because Vadistana has, I'm sorry, Japan has become a very confused and Zvadistanistic country. But they still inherit the Manipura of the samurai of yore. Durkenheim says this thing. You go to Japan in 1960s or 70s as a lecturer. Those were the days when the Japanese industry and economy was coming up. So they were having lots of courses. They were invited Westerners to teach them economics, whatever, to teach them a lot of things. And the Japanese were getting paid by the company to go and study, 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 learn, learn, learn. Improve yourself, improve yourself, improve yourself. And he said, if you are a lecturer from the West and you come to Japan, you have a shock. At least that's how it was in the 60s and 70s. You get a cultural shock. Because he said, when you go to a lecture where you have 100 Japanese students there, and you start talking to them about history or economics or whatever, all of them sit up really straight. Like you won't see anybody leaning or, you know, like bending their spine. They sit all of them very straight. And they put all of them, their hands in their lap, even if they sit on a chair. They keep the hands very civilized in the lamb, not like in some funny ways, you know. <laughs> they keep their hands, they sit up straight, and they listen to you, but they don't really look to you. And as you go on speaking, after five or ten minutes, their eyes are half closed, like Buddha eyes. And you get the disconcerting impression that they are falling asleep and they are bored. 
because they don't look at you, they don't say yes with their heads or something, they don't contribute. They just sit up straight, they put their hands like this, they close their eyes, and they listen very carefully, very carefully. And he said if in the end of a lecture, because he said I got this a couple of times, and I thought I'm a fiasco, or they are totally idiotic. And I asked a few of them. And they knew like 80% of what I said. They memorized all of it. And then I asked them, what do you do? Why, why do you sit like this? And they said, our teacher has taught us to listen while focusing on Hara. So they focus on Manipura. They sit up in a Manipuristic position. They put their hands in a meditative. They focus. They really focus. They don't do, well, you know, they don't use their tablets or iPads or things or, you know, they really focus on what it is. Careful audition. And in this way, you can have exercises of the five senses by using these things, by using these examples. I have met yogis who recommended, they said simply, use simple exercises of attention. Because attention, which is the equivalent of concentration, is a fundamental key. One of my friends, again, he simply said, I exert my attention, for example, when I'm pouring liquid from one bottle into another bottle. He said, most people, when they pour liquids, they spill. He said, I never spill, because I take it like a tapas. I just take a deep breath. Keep one bottle in the position, start with the other one, and I really focus. And I don't lose my concentration after 15 seconds. I just go on and on and on, and my hands are not shaking, and my attention is there. And I take it as a yoga project. For me, it's like a yoga project. I will pour the liquid from this bottle into this bottle without spilling one drop. This is my project. It's a project of attention. Like, I want this. This is something which I want to fulfill. It's yoga. It's yoga in daily life. Carrying objects in a balance. Either you're carrying something on your head or you carry some things. Why not achieve a balance? Why be negligent and think about something else and spill or break or damage when you could take it like an exercise of concentration? For five minutes, I'm going to carry this object from here to there. And I'm going to keep a perfect balance. And I'm not going to think about anything else. For five minutes, I'm going to th feel, keep my concentration on the job. Walking through narrow places or obstacles no? in daily life. Again, as kinesthetic exercises of attention and agility. Activities of search or selection. No? I have to select some things. I remember once I gave to one of my pupils... She was a Gemini, and I photocopied the book. In the old communist days, there were lots of photocopyings because the originals were not impossible to get. And people were using pirate copies, photocopied copies. So we had many books of spirituality in copies, and it was very easy to lose the pages and to dispar them. So I had a few such books. I had to make that girl, who was an accountant in her company, I had to make that girl do this three times. Like the same book, she had to select it three times. Because every time she lost her patience, and she was a Gemini, and she lost her patience, and she kind of did mistakes. And I told her, the number of pages doesn't fit. Start all over again. And the second time again it didn't fit. And I told her once more. And she did it until they fit. So this is like activities of search and selection. You can really lose, use your Ajna Chakra if you have to count 300 pages in a book one by one. Yes, then don't think about going to Tesco Lotus. Stay with the 300 pages. It's an exercise of concentration, an excellent exercise of concentration. Another element which belongs to yoga in the daily life is that you may choose to do consecration in various moments. Because there are many activities which would bring a big karmic input and, or output, and therefore you need to do consecration. There are many people who do a consecration of the day and of the night globally, but then when they get to some specific activity, they do it again. Like, for example, in Christianity, 
people in the morning and in the evening, they did some prayers, but then they separately did some prayers before eating. As equally as a yogi, you can consecrate the act of eating, because the act of eating is a peculiar thing. Ultimately, Mother Nature sacrifices herself. You are eating carrots, peaches, whatever you are eating. And sometimes you may be eating fish or whatever you are eating. One way or another, the nature is sacrificing herself to keep you alive. And then this energy which you eat goes and becomes sexual obsession. There are some people who as soon as they get some energy, they go and fight with somebody. They go and quarrel with somebody. Then it would have been better that you didn't eat. You should stay hungry. If your food is going into anger, then don't eat. You know, better fast for 40 days and keep your anger down. So if your anger is unhealthy and destructive, because there is Jesus-like anger as well. So what I'm trying to say here is the following. You may want to do a consecration. If you have ever been into a Buddhist retreat, they have wonderful consecrations. They make you repeat some prayer, like, may this food which I'm eating now not be for my beautification and for my vanity, and may this food which I eat now not just make me into a horny animal and into an angry bastard. May this food which I eat now be for harmoniously sustaining my life force, and may it transform into good thought, good thinking, good things, compassion, and other things. Like the food in your body can turn into anger or it turn into compassion. This is very much related with the consecration. Before you eat, you can decide. Or at least if you think you cannot decide, you can at least ask. You can pray. And therefore, remember that in some moments of life, like eating, making love, the tantric way, if you are a tantric yogi, and other things, you can perform special consecration for that particular event. And sometimes it's very, very important. Then, in the daily life, another direction to take, you can perform easy yoga techniques. Like, there are fortunately yoga techniques that you can do in the daily life. For example, let's take the most ridiculous one to start with. Ashvini Mudra. Some of you don't remember from the first level. Ashvini Mudra is squeezing your anus. Could you do a thousand Ashvini Mudras while you are working for your boss in an office? Who prevents you from doing a thousand Ashvini Mudras? Like three seconds in, three seconds out. Three se that is going to give you a huge Muladhara Chakra. That's going to give you an excellent sublimation and will purify. Nothing and nobody can prevent you from doing Ashvini Mudra. Or Mulabandha, more advanced, the contraction of the root. I've, I've known friends and I've seen yogis who would be doing even Udhyana Bandha. Not full on, because you cannot do it full on. But like you are sitting in the university with your hands on the desk, looking at the teacher, and you lean forward towards the desk, and you go like... <sighs> Who can prevent you from doing that? That Udhyana Bandha will maybe not have the force of a full standing Udhyana Bandha, but it will have the force of a half of a Udhyana Bandha. If you do 200 of those, it's like you participate to a course in the university, or you can even listen to Swami Vivekananda, and meanwhile you've done 100 Udhyana Bandhas. Yay! It's great. Why not? Then why not? So remember, you can do some of these things all day long, if the little midget in the head doesn't say, ah, give me a break. If the little midget wants a break, then you won't do it. Concentration upon the chakras. There are various ways of concentrating upon the chakras. I remember once I was with my first yoga teacher somewhere in the seaside by a beach. And, uh, you know, it was, I think it was one of the very, very first time when I've been with, my, with that teacher to a beach. And we went to a nudist beach, and everybody was young and beautiful and naked and everything. And we all were 
very elated and so on. And slowly, slowly Svadhisthana took over. Like slowly, slowly there appeared a sort of a beach atmosphere, a sort of levity, lightness, you know, like people what to do on the beach. And then suddenly I see that my teacher was not participating into all this levity. He had gone three meters away. He was facing the sea. He was with the back to everybody else. And he was standing like this, doing something. And then my good friend, who was a more bold person than I was, he went to him directly and asked him, what are you doing? So like, this is interesting, not the chit chat. This is the person who really uses their time. Like you are on the beach, but you can do something. And my teacher, and this can teach you a technique, he simply said, I'm visualizing the sun in front of my forehead, and I'm concentrating on Ajna Chakra, and this puts me in resonance with the world of the gods, with, which is called in Sanskrit Devachan. It's wonderful. You go to the beach, you stand up and focus on the sun in your third eye, and you connect with the gods from the Devachan, from the Devaloka, that's an excellent beach. Yeah? You go to the beach and da, 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 da. you are wasting your time and getting sunburned meanwhile. <laughs> no? So that's why I'm saying depends how much you want to do. Depends if your life is a yoga and you have the impulse of seeking, 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 going higher. Concentration upon the chakras, concentration upon the nadis. No? Like very often when I learned yoga, I found myself doing simple exercise. I was studying, I was doing something, and then suddenly I would kind of lift one arm, you know, just like this, while reading something, you know. I can do it while I'm talking to you. And meanwhile, I do a sort of tadasana, you know. I'm focusing a little bit on my nadis here, you know. It's a pleasure to, it's an exercise of awareness, you know. I'm feeling my nadis. It's very nice. Why can't I do it often, many times, you know, just because it looks weird, but when I'm at home, you know, I can do it. I'm reading a book, I'm watching television, and meanwhile I'm concentrating my cosmic energy to my right arm. Why not? No, because I want to do something all the time. I want to practice, I want to play with these things. Of course, the exercises of awareness. Who am I? There's a beautiful, beautiful fragment written by P.D. Uspensky, a direct disciple of Gurdjieff, who became himself a great spiritual teacher later. And P.D. Uspensky studied with Gurdjieff, if I remember correctly, in St. Petersburg. It might have been in Moscow, but I think it was in St. Petersburg. And uh, Gurdjieff had a brand new school of spirituality. And uh, Gurdjieff gave to this guy, he was a highly intelligent guy, Uspensky is a mathematician. When I studied high-level mathematics in the university, there are theorems of Uspensky. And when I read the theorems of Uspensky, I had no idea that this mathematician Uspensky was also a great spiritual practitioner. When he was young, he was mathematics professor and great mathematician. When he was 40 years old, he met with Gurdjieff and he dropped mathematics and he started doing spiritual science. And uh, Uspensky, Gurdjieff could see immediately, this man has a great mind. This man is highly intelligent. He has the mind of a mathematician. And Gurdjieff gave him the following exercise. He said, all the time, all the time, you should focus in the area of the chest and ask yourself, who am I? Try to remember constantly that you are, who you are. Ask the question and feel that you are. Uspensky writes in his, he wrote a book, he writes it in a book, which is called Fragments of an Unknown Teaching. He, he describes his young years with Gurdjieff, young, like early years with Gurdjieff. And he said, Uspensky said, I was horrified because this thing to say I am, I feel that I am. Right night, I feel that I am. It's me. It's presence. It's I'm completely present. I'm not thinking about anything else. I am. This thing seems to be the easiest thing in the world. And you obviously are. And then he said, I discovered sometimes that two hours had passed and I forgot to ask myself, who am I? He said, with horror, I noticed that six hours, half of a day sometimes passed and I forgot to ask myself, who am I? That's what I'm telling you. 
that midget, no? that you refuse to do it all the time, all the time, all the time. And it's like you want to forget. It's forgetfulness is the enemy. No? And then he got stubborn and he tried and tried. And he did this exercise for about, I forgot how much, a matter of weeks or months. And suddenly his strong mind, his great characteristics, he broke through. And he had an absolutely amazing, he had a form of samadhi coming from the heart chakra. And he had it all day long. And it was amazing. When you read it, it gives you goosebumps because he was like talking to his higher self. He finally discovered he like was talking to his guardian angel. He was like talking to God. He was like, suddenly there appeared a presence. Suddenly there was a presence. When he drilled and drilled and drilled and drilled and drilled and drilled, and drilled <gasps> suddenly something opened. One day something appeared. And, he was, and it took him three months, four months, let's say, maximum. And he was different. And then there is the famous story that Gurdjieff, when he saw him in this state, he made him stay in the house. He locked him in the house for a time when he said he was losing time. And then he took him out in the city. And he, he could see very clearly that everybody in the city was asleep, walking asleep. And he thought that Gurdjieff did some act of collective hypnosis. And he asked, what did you do to people? And Gurdjieff said, I didn't do anything to people. The city has always been like this. But you have awakened. You, have now, you are now in another state of consciousness. Now you can see why people think that the ordinary people are asleep. So it's the same thing, cultivating this constant presence. There are methods, like I'm sure if some of you will read Uspensky's fragments of an unknown teaching, you will want to practice that technique. Of course, it depends very much on temperament, because some of you are the compulsive, obsessive temperament who can do every day the same thing again and again, much, much, much obsessively, and you need to be so for this technique. And some of you are the absent-minded, distracted people who are all over the place, and it sounds almost impossible to do a stable thing like this all day long. So then you have to do, it doesn't mean you can't do spirituality, it just means you have to do other yoga techniques which are catering to your uh, temperament, which are fitting with your power. Generally, I wrote here as the last on this long list, development of attention and willpower. Like, development of attention. How do you develop the attention? You learn in the day seven of our yoga courses. It's like a muscle. If the attention, if you practice it, it becomes better and better day after day. If you are distracted and ignoring it, your attention becomes weaker. Development of willpower. Maybe you didn't learn this about willpower. We speak about it in one of the lectures where we mention willpower. Willpower is developed when you succeed and diminished when you don't succeed. So if you say tomorrow morning I'm going to wake up at 7 and do one hour of yoga, if you do it, after that your willpower will be 10% better than today. If you fail and don't do it, your willpower will be 10% worse than today. That's why it's very important never to take upon yourself tasks which you are not going to fulfill. If there is something which you promise to yourself, you must absolutely do it even for the sake of your own willpower. When you say you are going to do something and you don't do it, then your willpower will diminish from that. It's the simple law of functioning of the willpower. And that's why you can do exercises of, like you put an object on a place and you say, in three minutes from now, I'm going to pick up this object. After three minutes, you pick it up and you put it on the other side. And that has increased your willpower because you did you, you did exactly what you said you're going to do. It can start with small, ridiculous things, and still your willpower will increase, exactly as if you pump iron. It doesn't matter if you pump iron with some dumbbells or something from the gym, or if you do it with some rocks from the beach. Your, your muscles are still going to develop with both of them. It doesn't matter if the actions which you do are meaningful and great or small and without any meaning. You just have to be able to do those things. As you can see, I already finished that list and thus I'm ready to conclude. If you learn yoga 
with energy, with chakras, with states of consciousness, with emotions, with mind, with attention, with concentration, with awareness, and similar things, then you can use it all day round. Because all the life, you go to a disco, there is an energetical experience happening into that disco. The general energy of the 500 people who are dancing by a certain music is of a certain kind. That's undeniable. And you, in contact with that energy environment, you can do several things, as I said last time. And therefore, going to a disco, even if it's a disco which is not spiritual at all, going to a full moon party, is an experience which you can use in a yogic way. You can use everything which you do in a yogic way. Either it's something which you say, this is something which I want, or this is something which I do not want. This is exactly what I'm running away from. This is the thing which I'm rejecting in my life for this reason or for that reason. And thus, I hope this uh, will be an inspiration for you in uh, integrating yoga in your daily life. If your daily life is that you are a Tibetan Lama and you have been walled in a dark room for the next 12 years, then you don't have to care about yoga in daily life because your daily life is lived in the darkness and either you go crazy or you are doing yoga all the time because there is nothing else to do, simply. So if you are that kind of practitioner, then yoga in daily life is a superfluous concept because you don't have much of a daily life. But if you are people who are trying to blend living in the middle of the world with yoga, which is not easy, remember in the last 2,000 years, people that practiced hardcore Buddhism, hardcore Hinduism, hardcore Christianity, hardcore anything, they lived in small groups and isolated. It's much more easy to practice in an ashram or in a monastery where people don't come up with crazy things from outside and all the madness of the world is kept outside and people can truly focus on what matters for them. But today we are put in the situation of doing yoga in the world. I'm teaching a yoga in which you are in the world also because I have learned it that way. After I did one year of yoga or so, I went to my yoga teacher from those days who was my second spiritual teacher in the order of the teachers which I had in this life. And I told to him, I can see that I have to split myself with the family, with the university. There would be other things in the world which I have to split myself with. I would be able to just find a hut in a forest and go and live in that forest 25 kilometers away from the nearest person alive just live where nobody knows me, find a source of food one way or another, and just do yoga till the bottom, to the hilt, like to the 100%, you know? Because that's what I want to do. I don't want to waste my time and energy with anything else less than that. And my yoga teacher from that time stopped me with some very pertinent arguments. He said, it was communist times in Romania, he said, if you do that, your family is going to call the police upon me as I am the author of this. He didn't say it wouldn't be good for you to go in the forest. He simply said, you are going to create me trouble as a teacher. So take it easy because we live in a kind of society which doesn't forgive these kinds of excesses and you are going to go in trouble. You are going to have trouble and cause trouble to others. So he stopped me, but not because it was not a good decision simply because it was too extreme and it would have produced too many waves. That's why I'm saying people are ready to do effort. I'm teaching a yoga which I have learned in the world. While I did learn yoga and tantra, I attended the courses of a technical university, of a difficult, full-on technical university. I did it exactly in five years, like I did not extend it to six years or seven years or more. I did it in the right time, so I passed all my exams pretty much in time and so on. 
I had to go and visit my family a month or a couple of weeks every year and get bored to death by them and so on. I had to do a lot of things and I managed to do yoga being surrounded by the world. Then I started having tantric lovers and some of my tantric lovers were talking about polka dot shirts or ro dresses or something and that was another waste of time you know and it's like you know I was thinking like while I'm doing this tantra and I'm catering to the fucked up emotions of my girlfriend I could do three hours of headstand in the same time with the same energy you know it's like why I'm even bothering to do this you know like relationships can be a total waste of time and something like this and of course, I asked my teachers in those days, and my teachers denied. And they said, you don't understand the full picture. You are young and enthusiastic. You know, you want to be extreme in so many ways. But they tempered me down. They said, there is a value in living this life, in rubbing shoulders with everybody. Today, I can see it. Because it was for me, sometimes, like running with a 50-kilo backpack on my shoulders. I was running with unnecessary weight on my shoulders. I was carrying other people and other people's problems on my shoulders because I did not live in a desert or in a cave or in an ashram and I was like leaving the world completely out. I did it in the world, but in the moment when I learned to run with a 50 kilo backpack, I was really fit, technically, metaphorically speaking, yeah, because I could do lots of yoga and obtain high states of consciousness even in the middle of the world, which for other people would have been almost impossible. So it was a good training. It was a real good training. You know? It was a real good training that I would make love with a partner and that partner would not be capable or willing to sublime her own sexual energy. Every time I would make love, I would get a lot of Zvadhisthana. But once I learned to sublime that additional Svadhisthana energy, I became very strong. Then nothing could stop me because I could sublime Svadhisthana like this. You know? Precisely because I had been trained into adverse conditions. That's why there exists a beauty, and that's what I'm teaching. I, there is a beauty in teaching yoga in the middle of the world, in practicing yoga in the middle of the world. Either you live in Paris or New York or something, if you are not going to a monastery or in an ashram or something, there you will have to carry a lot of difficulties. And then there is the midget which tells you not to do spiritual practice all the time and give me a break. And then there are impurities and lots of other things. And yet, if you learn to apply yoga in every day, then you are like a bulldozer, you are like a caterpillar, you are like a hot knife in a piece of butter. You just go through it and there is nothing that can stop you. Your power becomes very great. This is the kind of yoga which we teach in Agama. We do advise you to do from time to time 10-day retreats or 8-day retreats, intensive retreats where you meditate and do something and it's very beautiful and I'm leading quite a number of retreats every season, every year, and so on. And therefore, we understand the value of isolating and practicing. You don't speak, you don't use your mobile telephone, you don't do this, you don't do that. And on the other hand, there is a value in the fact that you can bring yoga in your daily life. The fact that you stop before eating and remember and perform a little consecration and then you start eating in a conscious way and you try to feel the prana and do such things, this is automatically a very beautiful, very pertinent spiritual exercise. And this is how, for me, yoga in daily life, I, because I remember I'd seen a book called Yoga in Daily Life written by a Scandinavian yogi, and it was just about a yoga session. It described yoga sessions and things like that. And I thought that that's not what yoga in daily life is for me. And that's why, since many years, I wanted to come with this paraphrasing, with this other opinion, what is yoga in the daily life, starting with the concept of karma yoga, where for Mahatma Gandhi, his whole life was a sort of a yoga, and uh, finishing with all the things which I said here.
meditate carefully, think about where could you do yoga, what, what could be a yoga. In any circumstance where you are, what could be a yoga? No, like, do you like to watch the stars? Patanjali and the great text called Vigyana Bhairava describe of what is happening if you lie on the back and look at a star, choose a star, and gaze at it for 40 minutes, 50 minutes, one hour, without trying not to blink and not to wink. No, like even in the night when you lie down and relax and look at the stars, you could actually do a yoga on the stars, a trataka on the stars. And therefore, I'm telling you all these things precisely so you understand that it depends very much on your goodwill. If you want, there's a lot of yoga that you can do and you are going to develop quickly. People are asking me, Swami, how did you come to be able to do this or to do that? I've simply done it thousands of times until I became good at it. And that's, the people ask me, how, how can you feel people's chakras and give advice about the chakras? Honestly, I don't even know. I tried and tried and tried and tried and did and did and did and did. And now I can do it. I don't know when was the day when I crossed that line and I was just trying and then I was capable. But because I kept on trying, I did. No, like I'm seeing no, a very interesting person. Let's make it more spicy. I see in this hall a very interesting Shakti, a woman. I would say, let's make a meditation. Let's hold hands. It's an exercise of curiosity, first of all. I want to feel your energy. And that, for me, is also practice. Because I've done that a thousand times, now it's very easy, and I'm good at it. And therefore, this is exactly what you have to do, to try, to practice, to experiment, to do a lot of things. And in this way, you are going to succeed in many, many directions. I could speak so much about this. You got the point. I'm sure that from these three lectures, you got a lot of good examples. All the rest is up to you. It's a matter of practice and a matter of having the curiosity to go there. If you will have questions, although it's a bit early, we're stopping a bit early tonight, but although it's a bit early, uh, we'll stop here. If you'll have questions in the sessions of Q&A, you can come with questions from the satsang and address them to me. I don't know yet what I'm going to do next week on the satsang because I'll have to start a new series, a new subject. It remains valid that if you have a very burning desire to hear me talk about a particular issue, you should write it on a piece of paper, give it to the registration or to the teaching department, or there is a red post box. I hope it's still there, right? I'm not. There's a red post box on the pin board where the on the posters are near the registration. You'll see there's a red post box and you can put in it a paper. I sometimes forget to open it and to search it, but from time to time I do. And there is a there, so if you say, please talk about this subject or about that and that. I already got a couple of requests from some of you and I'm considering right now which are the best subjects for you this season. So I'm talking about things which will uh, hit the right chord things which are relevant and important for you to hear at this time, because otherwise in spirituality there are a thousand subjects to be discussed, and I could approach any one of those. Enough for tonight. Thank you all for joining the satsang, and I'll see you in the next satsangs, questions and answers, and activities.